Punk or volunteer, go to our website. Well, welcome again to Vineyard Church North Phoenix. So glad that you're here with us today, whether you're joining us here in the room or online, we're so glad you're here, especially if you are a guest, if this is your first time with us, we're honored that you chose to spend part of your weekend with us here at the Vineyard. My name is Keith, I'm one of the pastors, and we do hope that you enjoy the service today, but our highest hope is always that through our gathering together, you would experience God's presence. I, I hope that you already have and that you continue to experience his presence as we uh, study together from God's word, the Bible. You know, there are a lot of ways that you can give to God through Vineyard Church North Phoenix. And when we do that, when we give, we are able to do so much as a church family that is helping to transform lives and impact our community in so many ways. Today, I want to focus on something very specific that our giving allows us to do. See, here at the Vineyard, we want to reach our whole community for Christ. We want to partner with God to transform ordinary people from all walks of life, from all kinds of diverse backgrounds and experiences into extraordinary followers of Christ. Now, we're coming to the end of Hispanic Heritage Month, and for the past several weeks, we have been highlighting Hispanic and Latino church leaders, authors, and theologians. Our Hispanic and Latino family are not only a special part of our overarching diverse community here at VC, but that community is itself a vastly diverse community. So here's a snapshot of that community and one of the many reasons that our giving matters. Hola, somos colombianas. Soy originaria de Argentina. Somos chilenos. Yo soy del Perú. Soy cubano, nací en La Habana, Cuba. Soy de Guatemala. Soy del Salvador. Soy mexicano. Y nuestra iglesia, Peña Church North Phoenix, me ha ayudado mucho en seguir las enseñanzas de Cristo a través de la Biblia. Hola, soy José Hernández de Honduras y me gusta ir a la viña porque puedes venir como tú eres. Todos son aceptados y tienes un lugar para recibir y aprender del Señor. Hola, Hola. Dios nos bendiga. Somos, somos colombianas. colombianas y nos gusta vinjar porque nos aceptan como somos en este proceso de transformación. Hola, ¿qué tal? Soy José Anthony Sosa. Y soy de Cuba. Estoy agradecido muchísimo por la iglesia Viña Church, por los cambios y por las amistades que ahí he conocido. Es un placer. Bendiciones. ¡Eh! La iglesia nos ha ayudado a sentirnos aceptadas y lo más importante, tener a Dios en nuestro corazón y en nuestras vidas. ¡Gracias! Gracias a toda nuestra comunidad hispana y latina por todo lo que hacen por el reino de Dios y por nuestra iglesia. Thank you to all of our Hispanic and Latino community for all you do for the kingdom of God and for our church. Y muchas gracias a todos los que dan fiel y generosamente a Dios a través de Vineyard Church North Phoenix. Sin ello, no seríamos la iglesia asobrosamente diversa e impactante que somos. And thank you so much to everyone who gives faithfully and generously to God through Vineyard Church North Phoenix. We would not be the amazingly diverse and impactful church that we get to be without it. Will you join me as we pray for our giving and that God would speak to us through today's teaching. Father God, we love you. We worship you and we thank you for all that you are up to. We thank you for who we get to be as a church family. We thank you for everyone that we get to have the opportunity to reach for you as a family, as a community. And God, I pray that, that whenever we give, that you would continue to use what we give to impact lives, to transform lives for your kingdom. God, here in our community, in all of the many ways that we do that, and even all throughout the world. And Father, I ask today that you would speak to each of us as we study together from the Bible 
Father, I ask that you would give me the gift of teaching, that you would use me to speak whatever it is you want taught today, and God, that each of us gathered here in person, online, would receive from you what you brought us together today to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Have you ever had an interruption to your day? Something that, that throws a wrench in your routine? You know, you're just going through your day like you do every day. You get up, you get ready, you head off to wherever you normally head off to. And then out of nowhere, something completely interrupts your routine. I grew up as a, uh, a pastor's kid. My dad was a pastor too. And when I was nine, my dad was filling in for a church that didn't have a pastor. We lived in Prescott, and the church that he was serving at was in the town of Baghdad, Baghdad, Arizona. So every Sunday morning during this time, I would get up early with him, and we would make the hour and a half drive from Prescott to Baghdad. We would do church stuff for the morning. We would, we would eat lunch in Baghdad, and then we would drive an hour and a half back home. On one of these Sundays, we were on our way out of town, leaving Baghdad. And the highway here is, is just one lane in either direction. And a lot of it is stretches with hillside or mountainside on, on one side of the road and ravine or canyon on the other side. Now, on this particular Sunday, as we were coming around a blind curve, there was a car coming in the opposite direction. Only they were taking the turn a little too fast and were kind of straddling both lanes. Now, I was sitting in the back seat had my headphones on, listening to music, just kind of lost in my own thoughts. And as my dad swerved to avoid hitting the car, I looked up. I had been riding with one parent or the other, driving a number of times in all of my nine years of life at this point. And who knows how many times they had had to make a quick adjustment or, or tap on the brakes in order to avoid something in the road or, or another car whose driver wasn't paying attention. And each of those times, it was a brief moment of unexpected movement that was followed by a feeling of relief when I realized that everything was okay. This time, though, I looked up fully expecting that feeling of relief as I realized everything was okay and instead, I saw the mountainside moving toward us. It seemed to be moving in slow motion. My body expected that feeling of relief, but it never came. Now the car eventually came to a stop perpendicular to the road and upside down. And the windows were all broken out and my dad and I were, were hanging there suspended by our seatbelts inside the car. Now the good news is neither of us was seriously hurt. We were able to crawl out of the car through one of the broken windows. An ambulance picked us up, took us back into town, checked us out, and then later drove us down to the hospital in Prescott. And the car, of course, was totaled. Our day was completely interrupted. Whatever our plans had been for that Sunday afternoon and evening would never now happen. You see, this particular Sunday was also Mother's Day. And instead of getting back home that afternoon and, and celebrating my mom after she got off work that day, instead she would wait for the call that we were ready to be picked up from the hospital late that night. It was definitely one of those interruptions of life that you always think is something that only happens to someone else, right? You know, we were, we were going about our everyday, ordinary life, and, and we were interrupted, well, today we're going to look at someone's life who experienced an interruption in his everyday ordinary life. And after this interruption, his life would never be the same. Peter was a fisherman. That's what his life revolved around, catching and selling fish. It's how he made a living. You could say that fishing was his life. He worked with his brother Andrew and their partners James and John. Most days of his life, like most days of my life or your life, were probably quite similar one to the next. He would get up early, probably well before the sun came up, and he would head out to the lake, get the boat, get the nets ready, get the gear ready, and then get out on the water. 
And he would spend several hours dropping and raising nets, casting out and pulling back in, coming back into the shore whenever there was a sufficient catch for selling, preserving, or preparing. Then he'd head out on the water and do it all over again. Now, you may not fish for a living. I certainly don't. But I think Peter's life is a lot like my life. It's a lot like your life. And when we look at Peter's life, we can see our own lives, or at least the possibility of what our life could look like with Jesus. Now, Peter's journey with Jesus, his life with Jesus, begins in Peter's hometown, Capernaum. After Jesus was baptized, did you know Jesus was baptized? The Bible tells us he was baptized. It's one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, that we also get water baptized when we decide to follow Jesus. So listen, if you've decided to follow Jesus and you haven't been water baptized, that's your next step. Go online to our website, take our baptism class, and sign up to get baptized at our next baptism in the middle of November, okay? So after Jesus was baptized, he spent 40 days in the desert, and then the Bible tells us that he moved to Capernaum. And Capernaum is a fishing village on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as Lake Tiberias. Now remember, this was also the same body of water that Jesus and Peter walked on in Pastor David's message last week, okay? Each of the gospel accounts Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John describe different details of Jesus and Peter's first interaction. So picture Peter just living out his everyday, ordinary routine. The Apostle Matthew records it like this. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come. Follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Mark's account is almost identical to Matthew's. John explains that Jesus gave him the name Peter. John 1, verse 42. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Peter's birth name was Simon, or Simeon in the Aramaic. The tradition at the time among Jewish families was to name a child after a significant person from Scripture. In this case, probably Simeon, the patriarch, the son of Jacob. And then to also give them the same name in Greek, so Simon. So when Jesus meets him, he then gives him the name Cephas, which is from the Aramaic word for rock, or Peter, the Greek word for rock, being Petros or Petros. Now, incidentally, there's no historical record of the name Peter or any name like it before this. This is the oldest historical mention of this name, Peter. Now, Peter's father's name is John or Jonah, probably after the prophet of the same name. So Peter would have originally been known as Simon or Simeon bar John or bar Jonah or Simon, John's son. So Jesus decides to call him Simon the Rock Johnson. (laughs) Pastor Keith, did you just spend half a page explaining first century Jewish naming traditions to set up a The Rock joke? No, I did not spend half a page explaining first century Jewish naming traditions only to set up a joke, it is also interesting information. I'm kind of a nerd for this kind of stuff. Name origins, word origins, I'm just really, really into it. What can I say? Except you're welcome. (laughs) The Gospel of Luke gives a little more detail to this moment, to Jesus and Peter's first interaction, which involves a miracle. We're going to read it together out of the Bible, but first... Let's watch this. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. We've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. 
your word. brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, how sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. as well. Yes, you, James and John, come, follow me. I'll take the fish into market and settle up Simon's death. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> We've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> go, now. I think my favorite part about that is when Jesus is like, you know, throw the net down. And, you know, Peter's kind of like, nah, it's not going to work. We've already done this. And then he just kind of sits there and looks at him patiently and waits. Because I feel like he does that in my life all the time. Hey, do this thing. Nah, that's not going to work. Okay. Here's how Luke describes the end, of, the end of their interaction in his gospel. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, 
he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partner James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. So first of all, yes, the chosen took a little bit of creative license with this scene, but they still do a really good job, I think, of of capturing and portraying the essence, the heart, the emotion of what's happening here. Peter's life has been interrupted, and it would never be the same. At this point, he had most likely heard of Jesus. Jesus had probably taught around the area. We know that his brother Andrew had been a disciple of John the Baptist. And in fact, in John the Apostle's gospel, Andrew comes to Peter and tells him they found the Messiah before Peter ever meets him. Now, there are two things that we should notice right away here. And they have to do with Peter's identity, with the way that he sees himself. The first is his occupation. He's a fisherman. He catches fish for a living. Every day, he would go out on the boat onto the Sea of Galilee, cast out their nets, and hope to catch enough fish to sell and to eat. It was really hard work. They would spend all day exposed to the elements, under the sun, caught up in storms, and it was unpredictable work. Some days, they might catch a lot, and some days, they might not catch anything at all. It's quite possible that he came from a long line of fishermen. We can guess this because his brother Andrew is also a fisherman and they lived in a fishing town. So this is one of the ways that Peter sees himself as a fisherman. That's all he's ever been. And he has no reason at this point in his life to think that he will ever be anything else. Perhaps that's all that his father ever was. Maybe that's all that his father's father And his father ever was. This is his everyday, ordinary life. Jesus finds Peter in the middle of his ordinary life and extends to him a very simple call. Follow me. Now, when we look at the whole of Peter's life, it's abundantly clear that answering that call would be anything but simple. It would be anything but ordinary. When Peter looks to Jesus and he realizes the truth of who Jesus might be, when he realizes that Jesus himself is no ordinary man, when he and his brother and James and John struggle to pull up this enormous, miraculous catch of fish after a long day of casting out and pulling in nothing, and casting out and pulling in nothing over and over and over again, he is convicted by the reality of how he sees himself a sinful man. And if this man, Jesus, this far more than ordinary man, is who Peter thinks he might be, well, then how can he, an ordinary fisherman, a man who is full of sin, how can he even stand in the presence of Jesus? Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. This moment is an interruption to Peter's ordinary life. It will never be the same. Jesus interrupts his ordinary life and says, come, follow me. Jesus interrupts you in the middle of your ordinary life. Jesus interrupts your ordinary life. So what is your ordinary? How do you see yourself? Teacher? Nurse? Student? Driver? Mechanic? Server? Contractor? Doctor? 
Lawyer? Caregiver? Realtor? Analyst? Entrepreneur? Pilot? Manager? Assistant? Clerk? Laborer? If I didn't hit yours, fill in your blank. Husband? Wife? Parent? Child? Sibling? Whoever you are. Whoever you think you are. Jesus interrupts you right where you are in the middle of your ordinary. And Peter spends the next three years doing life together with Jesus and and 11 other guys. Jesus teaches them. He, He gives them insight into the things that God wants for them. He demonstrates the power of the Holy Spirit and the movement of the kingdom of God on earth. He empowers Peter and the others to do the things that he does. Healing the sick. Restoring the sight of the blind. Casting out unclean spirits. Raising the dead. And Peter and the twelve, they do these same things. And Jesus tells them in John chapter 14, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. And they do. They do the same works that Jesus did and even greater works. And Peter walks on water. He also falls in, but he walked on it first. And Peter goes on to become very prominent among the apostles, often speaking for the rest of the group to Jesus. I was talking to uh, another staff member a couple weeks ago about Peter, and she said, you know what I like about Peter? He messes up. I said, exactly. He wasn't perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. And Peter tried to stop Jesus from going into Jerusalem, knowing he was going there to die. Jesus is telling the disciples about how he's going to suffer, die, and rise again. And then Peter steps in. Look at Matthew 16. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Isn't that the trouble we get into? Isn't that why it's so hard to let Jesus interrupt our lives? We can't shake the human blinders. We can't stop focusing on that human point of view. We can't separate ourselves out and think, you know, maybe God knows more about what's going on than I do. Maybe I should just trust him and do what he wants. When Jesus and the disciples gathered for the Passover, Jesus took on the role of a servant and he washed his disciples' feet. Peter says, no, Lord, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus tells him, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have anything to do with me. Well, so then he says, well, then don't just wash my feet. Wash all of me. Peter messed up all the time. When Jesus needed friends more than anything, during his arrest and trial and suffering, Peter denied even knowing him. The Bible says that he actually swore. You know, he used bad words. He denied knowing him, not once, but three times. But he also demonstrated such incredible faith in Jesus. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son 
of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. In Acts 2, Peter preaches to a crowd in Jerusalem and 3,000 people decide to follow Jesus. Jesus had interrupted Peter's ordinary life with an invitation to follow him. Peter does the exact same thing Jesus did with him. Peter interrupts this crowd in their ordinary lives with an invitation to follow Jesus. In Acts 3, Peter and John heal a man who is paralyzed from birth. Everywhere they go, people begin to believe in Jesus and are baptized. People receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts 10, Peter receives a vision from God to begin taking the good news of Jesus, the gospel, outside of the Jewish community. In Acts 12, Peter is miraculously released from prison, and I mean miraculously. I'm not talking they got a phone call from the president with a pardon. I'm talking, he was chained between two soldiers and there were guards at the door. Then an angel shows up, his chains fall off and the gate to the city just opens up on its own. The whole time, Peter thinks he's having a vision until he finds himself standing in the middle of the street. That's when he realizes everything he saw was actually happening. Jesus interrupting Peter's ordinary life was really an invitation to an extraordinary life. Jesus interrupted Peter's ordinary life and he invited him into an extraordinary life. Jesus interrupts your ordinary life and Jesus invites you to an extraordinary life. Jesus invites me to an extraordinary life. The same interruption in Peter's life, Jesus brings into your life. The same invitation Jesus brought to Peter, follow me, is for you. The same invitation from ordinary to extraordinary is for you. Peter was just anybody. He was someone who was going about his everyday ordinary routine, who did more than that. And he did more because he let Jesus interrupt him. He did more because he believed and he acted on that faith, sometimes recklessly. He moved from ordinary to extraordinary. You see, while we continue to live our everyday lives, all kinds of things are going on all around us. People are born People die, wars are fought, peace is found. The kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God has not yet come. And we all, we need to be prepared for the return of Christ, but we need to not be so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. That was the disciples when Jesus ascended into heaven as they stood there just watching the clouds as he disappeared and just stood there watching and watching and watching. And finally an angel appears and says, guys, he's coming back. But in the meantime, they had work to do. But we also need to not get so caught up in our day-to-day, in the everyday, in the ordinary, that we miss out on what's going around us in our community, in our world. So some of you here today, you need to answer Jesus' call. Jesus is looking at you right now. Right now, he is meeting you right where you are at in the middle of your ordinary, everyday life. And he is saying to you, follow me. If that's you, my question is, what are you waiting for? Our ministry team is is going to be right up here at the end of the service. Actually, in fact, ministry team, could I invite you to go ahead and start making your way down to the front? Our online host team is ready for you. In a few minutes, as soon as I dismiss this service, 
If that's you, if you know Jesus is extending that invitation to you right now because he is, please come down, talk to one of our ministry team members, click on that prayer button, and all you have to do is tell them, I'm ready to follow Jesus, and they'll help you with the rest. Now, some of you, you've been sitting on the sidelines. You're either just content to wait and and watch and, and see how everything plays out, being a spectator. Or you're waiting for someone extraordinary, like Peter, to come along and to do something, to come along and to do the things that Jesus did. But Jesus has already called you. You have already answered his call. You have chosen to follow him. His call was an invitation to you to become extraordinary. Just like Pastor David taught about last week, you have got to get out of the boat. You have got to take some initiative, maybe with no guarantee that it will work out. But Jesus has invited you to become extraordinary. So wherever you are, Whatever your next step is, don't wait. Take it now. If you are ready to follow Jesus, take that step now. Talk to our ministry team. If you need to step off of the sidelines, take that step now. Tell someone on the ministry team. Grab someone in your small group right now. Tell them what you need to do and then ask them to pray for you. I'd like to ask everyone who's here in the room, if you are able to, please stand up. And I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for whatever your next step is. Father God, thank you. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. I lift up to you everyone gathered in this room, everyone watching online, and I ask right now that you would solidify in their hearts whatever step they need to take. God, for those whom you are calling to follow you for the first time, Holy Spirit, give them supernatural courage to step out in faith, to click that button, to talk to a ministry team member and say, I am ready to follow Jesus. And God, for those who have been waiting and watching, hoping for somebody extraordinary to come along, whisper into their ear, you are that extraordinary someone. I have called you. I have invited you to become extraordinary. Take a risk. Step out. I pray, God, that you would send a picture, a word, whatever it is that they need to do, and the courage to step out in faith. Put them with somebody for accountability so that they can pray for each other. And God, you have your way. God, you have your way. Holy Spirit, come, move, have your way. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Take your next steps now. Thank you so much for being here today. We're so glad you're here. God bless you all. We'll see you next week.